and those interested in local history and the social aspects of the past. Something like this, I've just, this is just chosen at random. It is a hunt scene for County Tyrone in 1911. And the social aspects around the big house in Ireland are very well understood and much researched. There's a lot to do yet, but are well researched compared to those that are more disadvantaged in life. So, compare that with this. And what is known by those that are poor and socially excluded? Now, the date of the two photographs that I've shown you are of the exact month and year. So it is a good comparison of those differences in society. And the life experiences of ordinary people, as I would like to term them, are emerging as significant to both the study of family history, local studies, and especially the experiences of those individuals are important because their historical account is often hidden, completely hidden, because they did not necessarily create records or well, there's little reason to create records. So you can look towards the official record. Um, those records created by official organisations such as the church, the workhouse, the hospital, the asylum or the court um, to really provide context and information on both the environment and the arrangements in which these people survived. So they didn't necessarily have to create their own records for us to reveal their personal stories. So I'd just like to illustrate a few, there's millions, I'd like to illustrate a few that I find interesting and to encourage you to go and explore the records held here for more examples. I'd like to identify historical indicators of poverty that can be identified. I'd like to reveal a few personal stories and they don't have to be the stories directly relating to your ancestors. They give context to the situation which your ancestors are in. They don't necessarily have to be um, directly related. And to explore the experiences of people who are deemed socially deprived. It include the homeless, the unemployed, the hungry, the sick, the deserted, the illegitimate, the disabled, the illiterate, so the ill, the poor and the criminal as well. One of the earliest records um, that refers to poverty that we hold here in the Public Record Office is a survey carried out by Captain Pinner and it's a transcribed record relating to the RJ Hunter papers that is held here. 1618 and it just says near unto the bone which he's referring to Macra Felt there are seven houses of slight cage work whereof five are inhabited with poor men. The other two stand waste. And that's a very, very early reference to poverty within the collections. But the strength that Prony has is the comparisons that can be made between the 19th century and the 21st century in both who was termed as poor and socially deprived and including the terms used, which some terms such as lunatic we would never think of using today, but they are contemporary with the documents that you may be researching. So before um, 1838, the task of relieving poverty fell to private charity and voluntary organisations. So the church played a key role in administrating um, charitable collections, and they were termed as the cess. Um, while townsmen administered alms. So you may be familiar with alms, houses, etc. And an early record of begging um, that I found within local authority records relating to Belfast dates to the 24th of January 1753 and it's a manuscript assembly book relating to the Belfast Cooperation. And it just notes individuals that may may not be recorded anywhere else in the whole collections, such as Widow of Joseph Barry or Sam Burns who's blind. So you have those indicators, people being given funds to survive on the streets. 
As I mentioned, the church was extremely important, and I don't want to to go too much in. It is really a quite a large topic on its on its own. I'd encourage you to dig deeper below what we know as the the baptism, marriage, and burial registers that we're familiar with. Go to the vestry minutes, the lists of pews, um, the money to the poor, the accounts, even the accounts if they survive will provide names of individuals and society. This one is just a list of names of the poor in the, the parish of Trory in Fermanagh in 1778. And you can see there there's, there's John Henry, um, let's go down a bit, Jane Sprott, Mary McMahon. So you have a list there, a very early list of individuals been given um, support by their local parish church and this is only one example. Other very very small notes, very hidden among the vestry notes um, can be little pieces of, of information that's just of, of general interest. This is just a note of blankets being distributed in Colin Parish, Parish Church in County Louth in 1810 and you can see there the names Widow Doherty, John Campbell, Widow Hughes etc. So it, sometimes it's a link to, to family that aren't recorded anywhere else at that time. The financial evidence or the efforts of the parish is also noted or placed upon tackling and poverty. So this is the Easter vestry for the parish of Antrim and it's quite nice the amounts that are being paid out for supporting deserted children, five pounds, coffins for poor people, ten pounds, and even bell rings for the poor, two pounds worth. So there is, there is a financial side to supporting and tackling the poor in society. But by 1774, um, charitable societies were established, including the Belfast Charitable Society, to formalise um, the support of the poor. And indeed, the first house of industry provided the unemployed poor with work <coughs> supplemented by food and often by clothing also. So it becomes more and more formal. But self-improvement was always key throughout history and um, throughout all the records from the 17th century until today, self-improvement was of a major deal basically in society. A poster issued by the Parliament of Ireland on the 20th of October 1800 states that the best method of procuring support and improvement for the lower order or for the lower order of the poor is by constantly employing them. So that, that was an emphasis within society, and indeed a social indicator was the unemployment rates. The majority of opportunities um, lay in both agriculture and in providing service for the big house in Ireland. And I just like this little caption from a private letter between James Hamilton Jr. and the Marquis of Abercorn on the 24th of September. <coughs> 1800, which emphasises the support or those that were pictured in the first slide, the importance of their role in supporting um, the poor. While I was at Barons Court, it struck me that something should be done with the little orphan boy and girl. Perhaps your lordship would take them over as servants. The boy would make a stout stable servant and the little girl who promises to be pretty would soon learn to be a maid. So that's a nice like little caption in 1800 of the role and the importance of gentry supporting the poor through employment. Another social indicator is hunger. And it again was tackled largely by the landed or middle gentry. And this slide is dated January to March 1847, so it has significance in Irish history and the period and what was happening then relating to hunger. It's Glenarm Soup Kitchen. It contains the names of the committee, the names of recipients of soup, 
and the money paid for the same. So you have Widow Rose Murphy. She had ten in her family and she got three quarts of soup daily. Peggy Dempsey, two in her family, half a quart daily. So you have even behind the poverty and the hunger, you have an indication of the social structure of those individuals' house and how those individuals were supporting um, their family through that charity. Indeed, the consumption of food was a basic need um, for survival. Um, the Nandity state, the gentry were very much emphasis and their records emphasise entertainment and society in association with others. <coughs> the records of the poor, it's all about survival. So we have here just a little note um, from private record of poor man's pudding. Um, something you can make um, when you're at home. Three cups of flour, one cup of molasses, one cup of raisins, one cup of suet, and half a teaspoon of soda. You boil it for three hours, and if you, if it was a holiday of something, you could put a wine sauce with it. So the luxuries were not there. <coughs> Indeed, the poor of Armagh are recorded in 1935, which is quite recent, um, eating or been given two pounds of potatoes and broth. In Castle Derg, the sick been provided in 1898, four pounds of potatoes and one pint of buttermilk. So there was a close connection between poverty, hunger and indeed sickness and the poor who contacted illness or disease were often made poor as a result of that. So the experience of the poor um, it's again, it's a diverse topic, but I think this image, it's dated 1914. This image is quite nice because it's the city hospital Armagh and it's the interior of the operating theatre. As you can see there at the top, the two horseshoes. I'm sure luck um, came into it. I'm just glad it's not like that today. That's quite recent, um, 100 years just ago and it is quite basic, but that's quite a luxury. Um, remedies to the poor were often through their own intervention, free intervention with traditional cures, and one of them um, was just at the top corner, it's very difficult to read, but I'll read it out for you. For pain in the ear or deafness, Hold a piece of bacon to the fire in the tongs till melting. Put three drops into the ear at night. <laughs> and another one nice, just towards the bottom for toothache, is if, if, there, if the tooth is broken, to melt a candle and place the wax of the, of the candle into the cavity, um, which is quite interesting. Another wives' tale was to pack a tooth with raven's down just to speed on um, its decay. So there's a lot of little stories there. Um, traditional cures were, all, were often the only option. So the operating theatre was maybe the best option, um, even though luck was involved in that also. We have a, a, an original record for you to look at at the end and I would encourage you to have a handle and have a look directly at it. But I'm going to refer to it. It's a poor law register, a border guardian register, a workhouse register. And it's very difficult to demonstrate it on the screen because the writing is so faded. But I'll quote from it and you can have a look at it at the end um, in closer detail. But poor law was the start of the state basically um, organising relief for the poor and administrating poor law. And it was from 1838 and um, through to 1949. And in fact, it was administered through the Poor Law Act. In the north of Ireland, there's 27 administrative units or poor law unions each one with a workhouse. So you're familiar in your local prime time 
such as Armagh, Banbridge, Belfast, Coleraine, Dungannon, Uri, Enniskillen, etc. All have that workhouse there in remains or transformed into other buildings. But something to remember, Crowley also holds um, Board of Guardian records for some southern counties such as Donegal and Cork. So represented here would be about 45 units um, relating to Ireland. So two types of relief. First, indoor relief. Um, simple food and shelter in the workhouse for family units and that family unit would work for the sustenance. The second would be outdoor relief and that is from 1847 where relief was given to the disabled in their own home. So there's those two things to look for because they're registered differently. The register here dates to 1864, it's for Belfast and I'd just like to, to point out, to look out for different reasons why individuals are entering the workhouse because that's always of interest to family history and to social history in general. On line 1053, so entry 1053, um, we have Mary Ann Cameron and she's entering the workhouse because she's pregnant and she's noted as single, age 20 and a prostitute. And it's always something really to note um, when you're looking through this type of material. The emphasis of certain terms that are used are no longer used today. They're no longer PC mm -hmm. or publicly correct or politically correct. So prostitute doesn't necessarily mean what we would see it as today. So something to remember and not to be um, affected if you're looking at different records of family. On down the list um, is another individual, um, Jane Maiden, 16, single, mill worker, and she's in the workhouse because she's a sore throat. So it gives you the different emphasis of why people couldn't work to survive. They enter the workhouse just because she had a sore throat and there's reference to her leaving again in two weeks time. Look for association as well because the next line down is a three month old child, Sarah Jane Maiden, and she's also in for a sore throat. And I'll not shout out her status, but again, it's the emphasis of the terms that are used then compared to now. So you have association there where people are entering together. So you can presume it's a daughter of the individual. Genealogical information obviously is important um, where there's no census material left or survives. And look towards indoor relief registers and they're just handwritten registers just like this um, where you find the date of entry or the date of indoor relief, the name, the place where they came from, their status etc and sometimes their occupation and denomination. So one ex or three examples would be Thomas Johnston, Newry, 27, he's single and a tailor. There we have um, on the 14th of November, James Thompson, Glasgow, 28, a labourer, and Leo Macaulay, Silver Hill, 7, child of William, who is his father, and he's registered as blind. So you have both occupation and disability listed in most of the indoor relief registers. Now these examples are drawn from the Inniskillen Board of Guardians, so it's only one example of the type of, of registers that you can get. They all take on the official structure that you find throughout them. Return of births, again handwritten from the Inniskillen Board of Guardians 1870. But you can, you can find little treasures like this. If you look halfway down you'll see religious denomination and it's listed as a state church in Tempo. So you get a, an idea of where the, the individual was living or where the birth 
um, is registered. So the family was going to the estate church. Return of deaths, again, very difficult to read. Um, but key information within that, obviously, is date of death. Um, which isn't always recorded in church registers where the date of burial replaces that date of death before civil registration. So in 1837, proof of the date of death of Mary Leonard, 13th of August 1837. And as you can see there, the cause of death, dysentery. It's always interesting to find what the patterns of, of the causes of death are. Also look out for Chaplin's books. This is one for Enniskillen again, 1850. And it just notes um, where the local chaplain visited the sick and fever hospital and baptised a child named Mary Ann, a daughter of Luke and Bridget. On the 6th of May, visited sick and fever hospital and baptised William, son of Mary Drum. So you can find genealogical information there that may not be in church registers, etc., where there's gaps, um, and they are a good substitute for that. Hidden, but it's worth having a good look in the area that you're interested in. Again, outdoor relief, um, where the support is going out to the home for disabled individuals. This again is in a skill in 1849. Um, just to bring it up to be a lot clearer for you. Henry Cunningham, male, 69, a fiddler, married to Mary. Francis Morrison, male, 55, a cooper, married to Margaret. So very often that is the only record of the married individual. So Margaret was married to Francis and Mary to Henry. And it's also nice there to find some interesting occupations. I think Fiddler is quite a rare one. Mm -hmm. Vaccination is another um, key register. This one dated 1877, relating again to Enniskillen. And it just, it just notes the name of the child, the age of vaccination, the date of the certificate, but from my point of view, what's interesting is the residence, <coughs> the town land. The town land is extremely important when you're searching for family or local history. And something like this will confirm where the individual is living at a certain time and who the register are. Can I ask you what yes. you're vaccinating for on those days? There's a variety of different things. Um, vaccination against a lot of diseases. I wouldn't know technically the, the Pacific diseases, but there's a lot of disease, diseases of the intestine, etc. And there's three Pacific registers relating to vaccination against diseases of the intestine. But there's all the other um, diseases that you would think of, basically. Um, let's see here. So this is in the skull. I'll just look closely here. Enniskillen actually is just registering the individuals and when they are registered as being successfully vaccinated. They're not actually registering their specific vaccinations that have been given, but I have come across a lot of registers, including URI, um, specifically noting down different um, causes, such as diseases of the, the lower abdomen. It seems a long time ago we were vaccinating. We yes. think of it as a more modern. Mm -hmm. Back into the 18th century. So it was like a preventative thing yeah. that, that was happening. And such something like there that I mentioned dysentery was quite rampant within society that had to be tackled in that way. Are they smallpox as well? Yes, that's slightly earlier. Yes. Smallpox would have been slightly earlier than the poor law. And it would have been more vaccinated outside, I think, within within more civil registrations. 
other, other registers to look out for, though, that I find interesting was things like seed supply books where individuals were given seeds to grow and improve their own situation. So something else to look. Not every unit will have this type of register surviving, but it is interesting. And more importantly, from your point of view, you can use and, and follow through the different registers for one individual, which may be of interest for you as family historians. So this is Mary Fitzpatrick Price. Um, it's a sad personal story, but the indoor register has her entering in a skill at age two months. The chaplain's book notes in July that her mother attacked her child in the workhouse. And the return of deaths um, note that the child died with a wound to the head. So you can, you can look for stories right through the registers and link those registers for that personal story. Experiences in the workhouse is also of interest, and this is from Yuri Workhouse. It's an offence and punishment book. And just as an example drawn out, Owen Trainer was flogged for stealing onions, and Mary Carroll was locked up for nine hours for refusing to work. So it just gives you an idea of the experiences of certain individuals. The environment also in which they were residing this is December 1906. It's Christmas Day in the Belfast Workhouse, and it's from the Minute Book. It's quite nice because Santa Claus, I know it's a little out of season, but Santa Claus is in the distance. Quite sinister if I was a child, but, and I'm not sure if it's a white beard. But the children are all there waiting on their presents, but you can visualise the workhouse. It's quite a basic environment but they're all excited there on Christmas Day, waiting on their presents. Very often planned immigration of the poor came from the workhouse, and Co-Rain Workhouse sent quite a lot of children to South Australia, and the cost of passage was paid by certain individuals within society. Passage from Belfast to Dublin, which cost five shillings, and from Dublin to Plymouth, 15 um, so Mary Gordon, 15, Louisa McCaffrey, 15, and Mary Stewart, 15, were all listed there in minute books as leaving Coleraine Workhouse for South Australia. So something else to look out for. The next social indicator I'd like to speak about is education. And the national school system was formalised in 1831, and it was administered by the Lord Lieutenant um, for the education of the poor in Ireland. And education records are of great interest because they both give information about the individuals attending school and about the different patterns of attendance, both in the town and country. Very often in the country you find spaces where boys disappear at harvest time to help in agricultural activities. You find in the in the the urban um, environment where girls were leaving school earlier and going into factories and industry. This picture is of St Mary's National School, Stewart's Town, and I'm told recently the building hasn't changed a lot. It is quite similar, but it's nice because some of the children um, have shoes, some don't. And one little boy has one shoe. So there's a story there, but it really gives an indication, the social structure, even within one school, of those just owning shoes, something as simple as that. It's dated 1930. The Reformatory Schools Act of 1868 um, turned industrial schools into compulsory abodes um, for juvenile paupers and offenders. And just to give you a few information on that, this is a record um, from the Fox Lodge Mail Industrial School Register, 1889. And it just notes an, a personal story of one individual. Robert, he's six years old. He was found destitute and receiving alms on the streets of Belfast on the 2nd of January, 
1889, and the official has transferred him from the streets to the Grampian training ship um, on the 19th of December 1892. And I'm told the Grampian training ship actually sat off the coast of Donacadee. It was a ship where the poor, the young child pauper, um, an offender was held for education purposes. And what happened was things like this. Um, this is actually not connected to the, the, the ship, but it is very similar in structure where the children are in an educational pursuit. They're in a physical training class. Um, this is from the Ulster Institution for the Education of the Deaf, Blind and Dumb in Belfast, 1900. And it just shows how um, both the disabled and offenders were educated apart from society, so they were excluded from society in both education and living. Other activities, such as this, um, was for self-improvement. So that brings up the issue of self-improvement yet again. It's a tailoring class, 1900, in the Institution for the Education of the Deaf, Dumb and Blind, 1900. So they're all there learning how to, to sew and to tailor clothing. The poor law um, and the, the administration to the poor and to the disadvantaged created a change in both landscape and the buildings that people experienced within the landscape. And I've put out two maps for you to have a closer look at later on. It's the map of Belfast before the complex was built on Lisburn Road and a map afterwards, just to compare how the landscape of Belfast changed at that time. But this here is a quite an iconic building. It's the Deaf and Dumb Asylum in Belfast. And I'm sure some of you have come across birth certificates where the individual was born at 51 Lisburn Road. There's no other notation. That's always um, the workhouse or the fever hospital or that complex of official buildings on the Lisburn Road at that time. So it's never or very rarely recorded as an official asylum, etc. It's always down as 51 Lisburn Road. But it's quite an imposing building and it, it really expanded Belfast at that time. The reasons for excluding um, individuals can also be surprising. Um, mental illness, obviously, is another indicator. And these registers are from Armagh Lunatic Asylum. The top one is the committal papers of Robert James Wilson, noted as a dangerous lunatic or an idiot, dated the 8th of November 1881. And he was in the asylum because of epilepsy. Okay. The second one down is the committal papers of Robert McConnell, a dangerous idiot, 1st of September 1881, and he's in the, work, he's in the, the asylum in Armagh because of dementia. So there's a real comparison there of individuals. There's individuals there because they have hallucinations. Very often, and I think it's 80% of the individuals entering the asylum are affected by religious mania, um, where there's one individual, it's actually Robert McConnell's brother, who entered the same asylum because he tried to stab his brother with a shoemaker's knife um, a few nights before Robert again himself was admitted. So there's a lot of sad personal stories there also. And again, you can picture the inmates, and that's, I'm using the terms directly from the records. So they're, they're not very contemporary to today, but inmates, these from the Downshire Hospital and the case books dating to 1869. Again, this slide is very difficult to read, impossible to read on the slide, but it's up there 
because it notes the methods of control within the asylum, which is always interesting. It's a register of uh, mechanical restraint and seclusion. It's County Ar Ar County Antrim Mental Hospital, and it's the register from 1937. The names are blocked out to protect the individuals, but I can tell you in the register, 32 named individuals were straitjacketed. 12 hours daily, 112 named individuals, their hands and feet were bound, and that was held for 12 hours daily. And of most, if not indeed all, were in darkness seclusion, and just in sheer darkness continually, and um, to control um, their, their symptoms, basically. So time has changed. This also notes where individuals are dangerous to society. So this is from the Crown Files of the Coroner's Court, and it's the murder of James Elliot. And I'll just read from, from what the, the official has written. James Elliot came to his death by a blow to his head, inflicted by William John Dixon, an inmate of Belfast District Lunatic Asylum, on the 6th of May, 1911. We attach no blame to management. Okay, so they like to, to put that note at the very bottom. We attach no blame to management. So it wasn't an environment, a safe environment, even for those individuals. One of the earliest records relating to exclusion from society is actually draws us back to the 1600s and notes within the growth transcriptions here at Crony. And just to show you quickly there, the top one is fines been given out for people living in an Irish house. Okay, and it's in the context of the plantation of Ulster. And the second one there relates to Henry, um, who's in jail for assaulting William. So you have a very early record of someone being assaulted and jailed for that offence. The jailhouse, though, was again a very imposing um, building within the environment and it became a site for exclusion, for penal servitude and indeed punishment. Um, Armagh Prison was built in 1780 and um, the one in Derry, which this is a depiction of the jail in Derry, 1824, and Belfast, which became the principal prison, the Crumlin Road Prison, in 1846 but it replaced the earlier one in Carrickfergus. So as you can see, it's a very imposing and intimidating building. And the Crown Books, basically, for London Dairy Quarter Sessions in 1910, just gives you a glimpse of why people were entering that building. And this is Mary Gillespie, and She's in prison because she's broken into and entered the house of Hannah Junkin with intent to steal and did steal a tin box containing a sum of money. Her plea was not guilty. The verdict was guilty. Her sentence was 12 months of imprisonment with hard labour from the 12th of May 1910. <coughs> she gets little notes there and there's even a note on this side of the jury so you have that context as well. The jury, the verdict, and detail on the offence. You'll also find um, snapshots of individuals um, who were, in this case, leaving prison. This is of Susan Mallon. She was released from prison in 1907. And she was in prison for three years due to the neglect of her 13 children. So again, there's another personal story, and that face tells a story, and indeed the dress that she's using um, tells a story um, about her life experiences. So whether you're interested basically in the poor, the wealthy, um, the socially deprived, key social practitioners, um, the three million plus records that Prony hold, um, remain a primary source for you all basically to look deeper into the stories that have only skimmed across. So I challenge you all to reveal those stories 
look deeper, look into the past experiences and um, recorded in documents, very much hidden, look for the environment in which ancestors were living and provide a better understanding of personal heritage. It doesn't have to be our own ancestors, but it is the society in which our own ancestors lived. So it's a better understanding of the experiences of that society. So this is our website. Um, just halfway down the right side, you'll find the e-catalogue. I'm sure some of you are quite expert using it. But putting in a search by clicking the top box um, here, you can put in a name such as I've put in William Wilson. I'm not sure if anyone's called Wilson, but it is the most popular listed name in the building. And I can tell you, putting in Wilson into the catalogue comes up with 44,000 returns. <laughs> so it's not the best way to start your family or local history. But putting in Wh William Wilson, such as that, will bring out records. And the top records that are listed are court records. So you can start with the court records for individuals named William Wilson. There's 996 William Wilsons listed, but the most disadvantaged or excluded are always the first that are listed. And when you click on one, you can find just the, the different information that you need to have a better look at that record. Always check that it's open. If it's closed, never be put off. You just have to write into us to request access to it. And we will respond to you by, by asking the responsible authority who created the record on your behalf to gain access to it for family or local history purposes. But you need the reference, etc., to order them out on site to have a look at the originals. You can also browse this button here using some of the just the very the very basic examples that I have given you. You can search for those examples in the area that you're interested in. So BG for Board of Guardians. And you can click on BG. And there's all the Board of Guardian records listed. Antrim, Armagh, Valley Castle, Benamina. So the area that you're interested in. So just let's click on one just to see. It's for Belfast. You can see day books, invoices, clerks, petty cash, accounts, etc. But more importantly, the outdoor relief registers, the out, the out relief lists, etc. And you can drill down through the original records because the person you're interested in will probably be hidden in each of those registers rather than catalogued under those names. And finally, if you're interested in things in abstract form, such as poverty in general, by just putting poverty in, it comes up with 16 itself. And just look at one. This relates to 1618, someone writing about their own poverty and wanting to claim um, or bargain for support. And if you note there, it's closed. So never be put off with when you find that. So thank you for listening. There's two maps here and a